Why does it always seem like cybersecurity is running in a different direction than the rest of the business? In this video, we're going to talk about security governance and how you can make sure that the business and cybersecurity are aligned to achieve the same objectives. If this is the first time that we're meeting, my name is John Good, and I'm a technology professional, trainer, YouTuber, and all of the above. If you like the video, remember to leave a like and subscribe to show your support for the channel and see the description for a link to full courses that I've created on other technology subjects. I also make sure to respond back to comments. So if you have any questions or you want to see certain types of videos in the future, make sure to let me know in the comment section below. All right, let's get into the video. So security governance is the combination of everything that defines and directs security efforts in the organization. So where do the requirements come from? Requirements that must exist in security governance might stem from laws and regulations, or they might actually come from the industry which your company operates within. For example, a global or multinational company has to follow the laws from every country that they operate in. This can lead to complexities. Think about if your company operates in Europe and they have to follow the GDPR regulations. Another example is a military contractor who will have strict regulations from the government on how to handle the data. Additionally, governance objectives and the programs themselves must be reviewed every so often to make sure that they are in compliance with each other. Security governance is something that has to be closely linked to the business and exists throughout the business with knowledgeable leaders. Companies can't expect to operate security in a silo because whether they like it or not, the entire business and how they operate is impacted by security. One of the very well-known governance frameworks that exists is the NIST 800 series or risk management framework, which is focused on government and military use cases, but is actually used by a lot of regular companies and private companies as well. It's important for the security strategy, mission, and goals to all align with the objectives of the organization. When security of some sort needs to be implemented, you will routinely be required to justify what is needed through a business case, which should link back to those business objectives. You have to balance the risk to the business with the cost and explain things in a way that senior management and senior leaders will agree with that approach. They need to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Security changes can be truly challenging to sell to the business because security is still breaking into higher levels of management and being a true staple of how businesses operate. It's not uncommon for security to report into the IT department. And this is an interesting debate because with IT, generally they are focused very much so on availability of the systems and data, where security, if you remember back to the CIA triad, security is focused on confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and protecting the data as a whole. When it comes to plans and security governance, we have three different major types. We have strategic plans. These are long-term in nature. So we're talking about five years or so, and these are going to define the security's purpose, mission, goals, and objectives. Practical plans are mid-length plans, about a year or so, and these define necessary tasks to complete the strategic plan goals. This is where we see things like staffing plans and budgets, to name a few. And then we have operational plans. These are very short-term plans. These lay out in detail the plans and tasks that need to be completed such as product design plans. As you can see on the screen here, we have this nice diagram, and these are the amounts of plans that you might see, right? So we have strategic plan, that would be one plan for a five-year period, and then we have the tactical plans. You would have several of these, so you'd have five because we're talking about one-year plans. And then operational, we're going to have a whole bunch of different plans. These are going to be the smaller time frame plans. Change management's goal is to manage change in a safe and secure way 
so that you are not introducing new risk to the organization. Think about if you started making changes to a department's applications without consulting that team or that department on the implications. Not only might you be impacting processes for that department or whoever uses those applications, you might actually be introducing new vulnerabilities that you aren't aware of. Change management makes sure that all interested parties are on board with what is going to change or what's going to happen. These changes could be to operating systems, applications, or capabilities. In my experience, I've been a member of change advisory boards or CABs, and these are basically teams that meet to review these upcoming changes. The nice thing with these meetings and these teams is that you have subject matter experts for all the different areas so you can really make sure you cover potential issues that might happen. This also eliminates some of those headaches that you might occur if you don't actually bring in some of those certain areas that are affected. And since change management tracks everything that happens, this makes discovering what went wrong very easy and you can identify what needs to be rolled back very quickly. Let's talk about data classification now. Data classification helps in labeling data based on sensitivity. By classifying data, you can determine which types of controls should be in place for which type of data. One of the well-known classification schemes that you might actually be familiar with is used by governments and military, and that's going to be the top secret, secret, confidential, and unclassified scheme. With this scheme, top secret data is the most sensitive and unauthorized disclosure could cause grave damage to national security. With secret data, unauthorized disclosure could cause critical damage to national security. With confidential data, unauthorized disclosure could cause serious damage to national security. And then unclassified data disclosure doesn't cause any noticeable damage. For example, the protection requirements around top secret data is significantly more than that around secret classification data. Now in private or commercial businesses, you might see a different classification scheme. This could be confidential, private, sensitive, and public data, where you have confidential data being the most sensitive data, things like intellectual property and trade secrets, and then private data for personal data, such as employee salary information, and then sensitive information where you keep it internal to the company, but it's not ready for release to the public. And then public, this is data that's out in the wild. Maybe it's on your website, things like that. The practice of classifying data also helps identify the types of data that you have on your network. Think about the types of data that you could have. Salary information, healthcare information, all these kinds of information should relate to some kind of classification scheme because that helps people know how to protect the data. Now, I've been part of engagements where we actually had to create data classification schemes. And part of that process requires you to do a full deep dive on the types of data that you have. A lot of companies don't have a good grasp on the type of data that they actually hold on their network. That makes it really challenging on how to protect that data. Not to mention, there are legal ramifications with certain types of data if you don't protect it correctly. Think about if you have healthcare records. If you don't protect that data correctly, you can be in serious legal trouble. Now within security governance, there are several roles that you want to be aware of. Let's go through those roles right now. You have a senior manager. This is ultimately the person that owns the security. The senior manager has to sign off on policies and fully support security efforts. Then you have the security professional. This is the person in charge of writing security policies and implementing those policies. Then you have the data owner. This is a high level person who's responsible for classifying the data and is responsible for the data protection. Then we have data custodian. This is the person responsible for actually performing protection activities such as doing backups, or implementing security solutions. And we have the user. This is somebody that has access to the system or data. The user has to follow any procedures 
and policies that are in place. And we have the auditor. This is the person responsible for making sure that the security policy and the implemented security solutions are adequately implemented. Now, we aren't going to cover the frameworks that exist deeply here, but I want to make sure that you're aware of some of the different frameworks that exist and that you should be aware of. One of them is called COBIT. This is called the Control Objectives for Information and Related Technology. It's created by ISACA. You have the Open Source Security Testing Methodology Manual, or OSSTMM. Then we have the ISO slash IEC 27002. And then we have ITIL, or Information Technology Infrastructure Library. Depending on what industry you work in, some of these will be applicable and some won't. You also have the NIST Special Publication 800 series. There's a lot of different frameworks out there that you should look into. Now, ultimately, with security governance, it all relates back to achieving two specific things. We have due care. Due care shows that we put forth reasonable effort to protect the organization by putting a security program and framework in place. Okay, so we put it in place initially. Then we have due diligence. This shows that we are continuously maintaining that due care effort and improving our implementation. So let's refresh that real quick. Due care, we put in place the program. Due diligence is ongoing effort to continuously improve that program. We have a picture on the screen here of the NIST risk management framework. And this is to show that the process is always evolving. We have to constantly improve our security program. Question of the day, which part of security governance do you think is the most lacking in organizations or in companies that you've worked for before? Let me know down in the comments. Remember to leave a like and subscribe to show your support for the channel. And until next time, I'll see you later.